And for our experts in emotion interview today, um, we'll be speaking with Dr. Lisa Parr, who will share her expertise on expressions of emotion in chimpanzees. Dr. Parr received her PhD in psychology at Emory University and is now an assistant professor in the Division of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science and directs a comparative research laboratory at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center, uh, examining emotional communication and social cognition in monkeys and apes. Uh, Dr. Parr has received several awards in her career, including the Frank A. Beach Comparative Psychology Award from the American Psychological Association, as well as funding from the National Institute of Mental Health the National Science Foundation, and the National Alliance for Autism Research. And on a side note, as a native Australian, uh, Dr. Parr enjoys fishing, cooking, and riding her motorcycle. So we will now turn to a very special Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Lisa Parr. So thanks for speaking with us today, Lisa. You're very welcome. Good morning. Good morning. So what I wanted to start out asking you a bit about is what first got you interested in studying emotion? Sort of where did it all begin for you? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think I'd have to trace it back to before I started grad school, I was working in a lab that was interested in laterality and asymmetries, and we were doing a, a project looking at facial asymmetries in chimpanzees, and so my role as the technician was to go basically be the photographer and take a lot of photographs of, of chimpanzees as they were making lots of expressions and playing and interacting with one another. And um, I wasn't really thinking too much about the, the goal of the project when I was uh, acting as the photographer, but after a while, you know, you look at, at their behavior and, you know, you, you naturally start to have questions. What do these expressions really mean and are they really able to interpret them and do they communicate something about emotion like, like human facial expressions? So that's where the, the sort of uh, trajectory uh, went from there. That's really interesting. So I'm going to ask you then a little bit about this trajectory because it's something that I know a lot of people find so interesting. I mean, what you've done is conduct this groundbreaking research to sort of systematically and objectively develop a coding system to quantify emotion expressions for the first time, you know, in non-human primates, in particular chimpanzees, which you refer to as chimp facts. Um, yeah. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about the steps involved in developing this system. Right. So um, the system, as you know, the, the facial action coding system was developed by Paul Ekman in the 1970s, so I can't take credit for the, the system itself. It um, really was a, a brilliant idea and still remains the gold standard for looking at, at facial movement um, in humans to this day. And, you know, like I said, um, we started to, to think about chimpanzee facial expressions and what they may mean. And as a, a sort of student of ethology, um, understanding about animal behavior, one of the first questions was, you know, let's really try and quantify what these movements are. And probably if I was studying a different species, it may not have seemed so pertinent, but when you watch a group of chimpanzees, the, the just amazing depth of complexity in their facial expressions is really um, quite daunting. So the first thing that we had to do was was just create basically a language to describe what we were seeing, and so that's that's where the chimp facts came. So um, basically, paralleling the development of the human facts, we first uh, did some dissections to make sure that the facial anatomy of the chimpanzee was similar to humans, and that's important because the face itself is quite different. The the structure and morphology of the of the chimpanzee face, they have a very heavy brow ridge. They don't have a, a fatty nose like we do, or these fatty cheeks or averted lips. So it's really quite a, a different palette that you're working with. Um, and we did confirm all 23 mimetic facial muscles in the chimpanzee similar to humans. And the next thing we did was a, a little bit bizarre. We actually did some intramuscular stimulations of the, the different muscles to verify that when the muscle contract, I'm going to make lots of weird facial twists, <laughs> I think, um, that, that actually produced the movements that we were seeing um, uh, when the chimpanzees were making facial expressions so we could confirm that specific facial movements were actually uh, due to the action of, of individual facial muscles. And then it was really just a, a painstaking task of watching lots of video and isolating examples of the particular movements and then creating the manual and the descriptions, um, which is, uh, you know, um, only a fraction of the, of the complexity of the human facts, but um, nonetheless, it, it needed to be done. So that's the, the basic process. 
So what do you see as the parallels between, you know, as you said, Paul Ekman's facial action coding system in humans and the system that you developed for chimpanzees or chimp facts? Mm -hmm. Well, the system, the system is identical in, in all of the different steps in the, um, you know, the, the resources that it provides for you. So um, we have um, individual action units similar to the, to the human facts. The numbers are identical because the musculature is identical. And, and basically, if, if you throw out a series of numbers to me, I can tell you what that expression is in the, you know, a, AU6, AU12, and, um, and you know exactly what the expression is. So it, it just gives us that objective tool to describe what we're seeing without having to say, is that a bared teeth? Because it kind of looks like a bared teeth, but there's also this other movement in there, and it, you know, it, is it really prototypical or not? So it, it gives us the ability to, to really describe that with a lot of precision. I mean, it's fascinating, and I'm sure you get many questions about what can we use chimp facts for? And when you get asked these kinds of questions, what do you think are the promises that can be used with this tool in coding, you know, systematically mm -hmm. emotion expressions in the faces of chimpanzees? Yeah, um, you know, I think the questions still remain um, in terms of humans. I think the real um, fascinating part of, of uh, animal communication, especially a, a species as complex as a chimpanzee, is what are all the the nuances of the of the communication that they use and. You know, even in humans, um, you know, Paul Ekman described prototypical facial expressions, these expressions of basic emotion like anger and fear, and, you know, these are really hard emotion words. Um, but the, the reality is that the everyday communication that we have is filled with subtle nuances and, and micro expressions and very low intensity versions of expressions. We don't walk around all the time with these huge, big on-off static um, displays. And chimpanzees are, are the same. Um, and you know, like I said, if I had studied was studying a maybe maybe simpler species, I don't want to use that with well, that word in quotes, simpler species. Uh, you know, it wouldn't have been maybe such an urgent need. But because the the chimpanzee is so, uh, there's really just such an, an amazing amount of complexity in how they they communicate with one another that you know it made it really necessary to develop that tool. And I also know you've talked a lot about the importance of context in interpreting these expressions, and I wonder if you could just say a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the, of the complexity is, you know, one expression is not tied with one context. It's, um, you know, they can be used across a range of different contexts. You can, you know, see animals that have been involved in a fight baring their teeth at one another, but then you can see a, a mother greeting her, her infant and baring the teeth. So here you have what appears to be the same expression used in drastically different contexts, and it, you know, it raises the question, you know, what do these expressions really mean and how do they really function? And at least to date, um, there there haven't been a lot of studies um, looking at, at function. It it's, uh, takes a lot of time and, and a lot of um, dedication to do those sorts of studies because you have to wait for the expressions to occur. And so it, it's um, that's a, a big project, but one that, that really needs to be done. But I'll give you an example of one um, um, data set. My colleague in developing the, the chimp facts, Bridget Waller, who's in the UK at Portsmouth University, um, has done a study looking at play signaling in chimpanzees. So chimpanzees have a very characteristic play face. They drop the mouth open and they usually keep the upper teeth covered. Um, but during um, certain play bouts, sometimes you see flashes of the upper teeth and it raises the question is that, what is that additional movement communicating in the context of play? And what she found was that individuals who flash the upper teeth are usually uh, more dominant or older than their play partners. And when the upper teeth are flashed, it extends the length of the play bout. So it may signal something like, you know, we're, we're a disparate dyad, I'm higher ranking than you, or so there's some maybe some social tension there. But when I flash my upper teeth, I'm signaling, hey, it's okay, we can still keep playing, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. So maybe like, you know, a younger sibling playing with their older brother and, you know, so there's, there's a real uh, mediation of that interaction through the use of this additional movement. And, you know, that isn't an expression in and of itself. So until the chimp fax was created, we wouldn't have had a way to really um, very nicely quantify and, and describe these things. And just a little bit, I mean, I know when people go about thinking 
that they want to train and become, you know, a certified facial action coder in the sort of human fact system. You know, it takes 80 to 100 hours and, you know, these laborious tests that, that people go through um, having been a fax coder myself. And I just wonder if it's the same kind of intensive training process when it comes to chimp fax too. Yeah, we really recommend people who want to use the system that they first become certified on the human fax because it, it's, it's such a, uh, the system is so much more in depth than humans because there are um, additional movements that humans do that we weren't able to find in the chimpanzee. Um, that's sort of an interesting thing that because I guess um, you could speculate that it's because of the facial morphology, the upper part of the face of the chimpanzee is not nearly as as mobile um, as the human face. For example, they don't have eyebrows, they have a, a heavy brow ridge, but it's the same color as the rest of the head, and so you don't get all the sort of upper facial signaling that, that you do in humans. So it's a, it's a reduced form of, of the facts as a whole. So we recommend that people uh, first learn the human facts, which yes, takes a long time. Um, but once they learn the human facts, the chimp facts is really, is really quite straightforward. This is really interesting just thinking about, you know, the development of this coding system for being able to quantify emotion expressions in chimpanzees. And I know a related line of work that you've done has also looked at sort of emotion discrimination or recognition in chimpanzees. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about your work here and their ability to recognize or seemingly discriminate between different facial expressions among other chimps. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it was one of the first questions that we had. We uh, noticed that chimpanzees have a variety of, of facial expressions, just like humans, and we wondered whether they saw them as discrete categories. Um, so again, I sort of have a part-time um, career as a photographer. Uh, spending a lot of time taking pictures of, of chimpanzees and of course there are challenges in that they're always behind a tree or something like that. Um, anyway we put together a, a, a really nice uh, stimulus set of, of photographs and we use a computer interface to test their recognition ability. It's a very straightforward um, task called a match to sample task. They they actually use a joystick to manipulate a, a cursor on the computer screen. Yeah, it sounds mm -hmm. it sounds kind of crazy, but it, they're actually extremely good at it, and they they really love to do that sort of task. So they first see a picture, what we call the sample, and then they see two comparisons. One matches the sample, and it can match on a variety of different visual or 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 um, you know content wise dimensions. So the first thing would be simply to present them with a picture of an expression and the match is the identical picture. But then, you know, your, your question is really about picture matching and not about expression recognition. So what we did instead is we gave them a, a picture of a facial expression as the sample and the correct choice was a different individual but making the same category of expression. And then the non-match was every other expression category. So we had all different combinations. And we found that um, without really any training at all, they were able to match those basic categories uh, across different individuals. So um, it just proved to us that these, uh, these facial signals are, are very salient, easily recognizable, and uh, seem to sort into um, the same sort of categories that, that we were seeing, which was, which was nice. Well, that's fascinating work, and I'm incredibly impressed too, as you say, that they're able to complete this computerized task just as any, you know, human research participant might. Yeah, yeah, they um, they're very good at that. One question I'm sure you've been asked, and I don't know if there's an answer to this, but you found that they can reliably discriminate between emotion expressions within their own species. To what extent do you think there's any ability for cross-species recognition? Perhaps between people might ask you a chimp and a human, and do we know that answer at this point? Yeah, we don't really know the answer at this point. I think, um, you know, because we, we work in captivity in a laboratory environment, there are restrictions in terms of, um, you know, safety protocols. We have to wear uh, surgical masks and uh, shields to cover our, our faces and things to prevent cross-contamination. And, um, and so it's questionable how much the, the chimpanzees actually know about our facial expressions. Um, you could certainly use facts to um, compare similar facial expressions based on the movements that are involved and see if the chimpanzees can tell, hey, that's a AU12 plus 6, I'm going to match that to the human AU12 plus 6. Um, and those are, are definitely things that, that we have lined up to do. 
Um, the other thing that we've done is simply try and use facts as a tool to match homologous uh, facial movements, so uh, movements that we believe are derived from a common ancestor. So we could ask the question, do chimpanzee expressions resemble any human uh, basic facial expressions? And when we do that, um, like I said, chimpanzees don't have a lot of upper facial movement. So if you kind of discount some of the upper facial movements, you can match chimpanzee facial expressions to a surprising variety of everyday human emotions like joy and surprise and and sadness and excitement um, and 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 those line up in terms of the actual movements that are that are used to produce those expressions. Thank you so much for speaking about your work. I know this is something that a lot of people in the you know study of human emotion want to know how much we can also understand the emotions of non-humans and so your work has just done a really beautiful job beginning to lay those steps out for how we can even begin to quantify, you know, something like an emotion expression. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, it sounds like you have some steps in line for where you want to take the research next. And I wonder from your perspective, sort of where do you see the future of emotion in this field headed? That's a great question. It, it's such a complicated topic, and I'm not sure that we're much closer in the last few years in really understanding at a philosophical level what emotion in animals really is. Um, there are a number of uh, exciting young investigators um, who are working in this area, and you know, I think just like in, in human work, what we need to be careful of is having really detailed descriptions of behavior uh, and understanding that behavior um, in terms of the context in which the expressions are used um, and the subtle nuances, so these micro expressions. And so it's really, I think, getting away from the kind of static pictures of prototypical expressions and, and getting down into the, into the trenches in terms of everyday communication and exactly what, uh, what the animals are doing. And, and I think for that, there's going to need to be a little bit of a revolution in how we study these sorts of things. You know, I can't ask my animals to, you know, sit behind a camera and look perfectly uh, face forward and, uh, you know, and study them in that particular context. So we need to, you know, find a way to get cameras on the ground and, you know, integrate um, the perspective of lots of different cameras so that we can actually sort of get down at their level and, and, um, and, and you know, um, look at it from that, from that point of view, from their point of view. So what advice then do you have for future students who are thinking about embarking in the study of emotion, in particular studying an emotion, you know, in non-humans, chimpanzees, for example? Wow. Um, well, be objective. Um, it's, it's really, really difficult to uh, think about emotion in other animals without invoking our own emotion. Um, it's really just impossible because we see things through our eyes and um, I think just stepping back and, and being objective and, and making sure that, you know, it's the science and the results that are, that are speaking um, as opposed to, you know, using our own, um, um, you know, um, perceptions and, um, you know, we have, to, we have to just make sure that we're being as objective as possible and um, it's challenging. Well, amidst all the challenges you've continued to do, what I think is some of the most amazing work in this field. So. I just want to thank you for speaking with us today and being part of this, you know, series in understanding emotion better. It's an exciting thing. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. So thank this you. concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Lisa Parr from Emory University.